Now, as I was looking at this passage, it reminds me how human beings from the very beginning of life need food, needs nourishment. And in fact, one of the things that the first things that once a child is born, one of the first things they give a child to a mother to hold the child, but also to rest free the child. Because one of the first things you want for the child is for them to have nourishment and to, to feed. Now, as I remember those years when Joshua was a young infant, I mean, his, his needs were very basic. To be held, to be changed, to, 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 and, and to be fed. And, 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 and thus repeats the process time and time again. And you nourish him, and the food is essential. He gets all his nourishment and stuff, and so food is essential to life. In fact, if we don't have food and water, we don't last no more than a week. Food and nourishment is essential to life. And if you want to be healthy, you, you have to eat certain foods to be healthy. We need nourishment. And it, many might even be thinking right now as I'm talking about food, you're thinking, well, I'm kind of hungry right now and I would like to go get something to eat. And pastor, please stop talking about food. I'm ready for lunch. That being said, <laughs> the point of this is that food is important for living a healthy, productive life. But that is not only true for physical food, but it's also true for spiritual food. You need spiritual food, spiritual nourishment. And nothing of this world can feed you. It only has to come from above. And that is what Jesus is going, is partly talking about. He's talking about he is the nourishment. He is the spiritual food we need to feed us spiritually. And just like if you don't have physical food, you'll die. If you don't have spiritual food, you will die spiritually. And so today, as we continue our series, oops, I forgot to mention that, but I won't worry about that. In the Son of God and the Gospel of John, we will look at today the bread of life. The bread of life from John 6, 41 through 59, as we just read. And we'll look at five points. Um, I kind of broke it up into five points just to make it manageable. The first is the grumbling. The second is the Father. The third is the bread from heaven. The fourth is the spiritual food. And the last is a life in Christ. The grumbling, the Father, the bread from heaven, spiritual food, and life in Christ. Now, one of the things is, before we get into this message, we need to remember where we are in the storyline, because the chapter 6 started a long time ago. We're now in verse 41, it feels like a light year ago, just starting this chapter. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, they had gone, Jesus had left from Capernaum, went to uh, Bethsaida to rest, and a crowd had followed him. And the crowd came to him, and he taught them, and he healed them, and then he multiplied the breads, uh, loaves, and fishes. They tried to make him king, but he rejects that. And then him and his disciple cross back over, and Jesus walks on water. And then now he, he reached back to Capernaum, and the crowd were looking for him, and they go seek him again. And as Jesus sees them, he confronts them and says, you know, you... You think you want me, but what you really want is a bread. You want to be fed. You want a physical king. You want physical nourishment. And what Jesus wants to understand is that's not what you really need. You need spiritual nourishment. You need to redeem. You need to be saved. And that Jesus is revealing that they have only the things of earth in mind instead of the things of heaven. And so this is, and now as he continues this story, as he looks at this idea of, bread from manna from heaven, he goes into greater depth of what he means by it. Uh, there's also, there's Capernaum, and that's pr maybe, that's the location where the synagogue was, except it's below it. But let's look at this passage again, and we'll look a little slower, and start on the first part, the grumbling, and start in verse 41, it says, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. 
And they're saying, if the, not, is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, who father and mother we know? How does he now say, I come down from heaven? The only thing is I love this word grumbling because if you were to look at the word in, in Greek, it's actually an omnipolitic word, and it could quite literally be mean, um, it's quite, just like you think grumbling, a person that, that they were grumbling against Jesus. They were unhappy about Jesus. And why are they unhappy about Jesus? Because he said, well, I came from heaven. I am the bread that came down from heaven. But he's, he, and as they hear that, they're like, that's not possible. How can you come down from heaven? And so they're confused by this. Now, if you remember earlier, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who has seen the son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise up on the last day. But one of the things that he wants them to understand is he is his, his father, is, is he has a spiritual father, and that God is a spiritual father, and that he came down from heaven, and that anyone who believes him will be resurrected. And this is what the complaint is. They're saying, how could this man, this man who we know his father and mother are, how could this so-called man come down from heaven? How could this so-called man be, have God be his father? Because they might talk about God being the father in a in, in a general sense, like we would call God our Father, but when Jesus says he's my Father, it's this personal relationship, and it's nothing like the Jews would understand that. How they would have been like, how dare a simple man declare that God of the universe was his Father? And so they're angry, and, and, and quite literally, I mean, if, 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 they were right, Jesus was wrong, right? And so the question is, who is Jesus? Because if he is not the Son of God, if he's not the Messiah, then the Jewish leaders would be right. But the comes to the question is, who Jesus is? And this is a question that gone through all the time and all eternity, it comes back to what like Jesus told Peter, who do you say that I am? And if, is he the son of God or is he just a non-man? You know, I like this one story in, uh, uh, or in the book of Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis has this quote. It's a famous quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. And it's about the identity of Christ. Who is he? It says this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the real foolish thing that the people often say about him. I am Ray to say Jesus is a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. By the way, that's what the crowds were saying about Jesus. They liked him as a good religious teacher, but they don't know about this idea, claim of God. But that's something we must not say. But as he goes on, he says, a man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who said he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is a son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. Let us not come with a patronized nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend it to. And here, here's the question that is posed to this crowd, posed to this religious leader. Who is he? And if he is who he is, they have nothing to grumble about. And so Jesus now is going to interact with them to see, to reveal who he is. And that, not that he hasn't already revealed enough to him. Remember, he's already done miracles. He's already done teaching. They've already known this, but yet it doesn't seem to be enough. But next, the father. And then this next part is really showing how the father and son 
are together. It's a mutual relationship, and it isn't just Jesus claiming these things, but it comes from quite literally the word of God himself. How does Jesus respond to the unbelief? It's interesting. He says this. Jesus answered, said to them, stop grumbling among yourself. Stop grumbling. Stop complaining. Stop, you can even say, stop disbelieving. See, believe, stop it. Stop your grumbling. Now, it's important that they first to stop your grumbling. Why? Because grumbling, and it's what these Jewish leaders wrote, that grumbling is distracts them from belief. Grumbling stops us from seeing the truth of God. The grumbling keeps us seeing that God is faithful to his promises. Grumbling is one of the worst thing to your Christian faith. And if you are a grumbler, I encourage you, as Jesus said, stop your grumbling. There's nothing more damaging to your faith than to be a grumbler. And even worse, I see a say to be a grumble. But also be aware of having people in your life who are, are grumblers. Be careful, because grumblers often, even if you're not a grumbler, can affect your relationship and how you see the world and how you see God. It leads to people having questions and doubt their faith. Beware the grumblers, and keep in mind, keep them away. And if you struggle with grumbling yourself, I encourage you, stop grumbling. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because if not, it can lead you astray. But then it goes on to verse 44. It says, no one can come to me unless a father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. The second thing Jesus wants us to know that the only ones that come to him are those who God draws to him. And, and to understand drawing, you can, you can imagine drawing a heavy anchor out of the water or drawing the hoe as you hold the garden is a drawing and pulling. That's what this Greek word for drawing means. And it is God who draws us and seeks us and calls us. And only those who the Father has drawn responds. And, and so it God, and it reminds me in Ephesians 2.8, I think I have that. Ephesians 2.8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not yourself, it is a gift of God. God is the one who draws. God is the one who enables saving faith. God is enabled by grace. Salvation is by God, by God alone. And I don't care if you're Arminian or Calvinist or something in between. One thing we can all agree, no matter what you're uh, how you view salvation, it is God who brings people to Christ. Now, he uses you and me. And, and we, we ultimately, as God is drawing us, we ultimately make a choice. God enables us to make a choice. He enables faith. But ultimately, we, all, we do make a choice to some degree. And he brings people to Christ. And he uses you and me to bring people. In fact, not only does God is the author of salvation, be the author of the means of salvation, which is for you to go out and share the gospel. One of the ways he draws people to Christ is by school going out into the community, you sharing in your faith, you praying for people. In fact, that's one of the things that most is important, that prayer needs to be a greatly a part of evangelism and reaching for Christ or bringing people to faith. I'm certain if I ask John, every time he goes out as chaplain, it starts with prayer, right? Prayer is essential because only God can soften the heart and bring people to God. And only that is what's going to raise them up. And beloved, I find this understanding of salvation so comforting because it's not based on my effort. It's not, but it's not God saying, okay, Jerry, if you don't reach them for Christ, well, too bad, Jerry, why didn't you do better? You should have had a better argument. No. Salvation is by Christ. God will use you to reach people to Christ, but ultimately, he is the one who brings people across the finish line. And therefore, 
I, I do my part to raise Joshua up in the Lord, but ultimately it is Joshua's relationship with God and God's relationship with Joshua that will bring him to faith in Christ. I do my part, but in the end, it's not on my shoulders. It is God who's sovereign in control of that relationship. Same with your family members. God is the one who draws up. As we've reached people for Dexter and Maine and our country, it is God who ultimately brings people to Christ. We just have to do our part. God wants to use you to reach people for Christ. You don't have to get them across the finish line. You just got to do your part and leave the rest up to God. And it's amazing how God works. That being said, we're going on to verse 40, 45 as I was lingering there. Verse 45 then says, It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who's from God. He has seen the Father. Jesus here is quoting from Isaiah 54, 13. And uh, Isaiah 54, 13 says this, All your sons will be taught of Yahweh, or of the Lord, and the peace of your son will be great. Now, this is a great passage because it's after Psalm 53, because, because that means we're in Isaiah and we're starting to see the new covenant promises and God telling them about the new covenant promises. And one of the New Testament promises is that their sons and daughters will be taught by God. And quite literally, it is right before them, Jesus Christ is speaking to him. He is God incarnate. And in fact, that whatever the Father says, the son says, and whatever the son says, the father says. I know which when we look at God and we look at Jesus, that there, that there isn't two voices. They are in complete unity. They are in complete agreement. The father and son are unified as they reach people for Christ. They're unified what the scripture says. One of the things I always tell people is do not bifurcate the Bible. Like, oh, that was God the Father in the Old Testament. Now we got Jesus, and oh, that's so much better. No, it's the same God. We have a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're all God in perfect unity and perfect conformity. And whatever the Father says, the Son says. And you can see throughout the Scripture how there's a unity of what God has for us. And so the next time you're reading through the Old Testament, New Testament, and you think about it and think, God is speaking to me. God is speaking to me. I hear his voice. And if you want to hear God's voice out loud, just read the Bible out loud. And I love listening to reading the Bible out loud. There's something about, you know, if you, if you ask a teacher, what's the best way to learn? I, I've said this many times. Have a book, read it out loud, underline, maybe make notes. The more you engage with the text, the better you learn. Don't just, when you read quietly to yourself, and I don't know about you, when I read quiet to myself, I can sometimes get lost, and the words come. And they start, eh, what would I read? I don't... Uh, but if you read it out loud, there's something like hearing out loud. Now, if you're not a good reader, get the Bible and audio, uh, I, when I work out, I listen to my Bible gateway and I'll listen to uh, three, three chapters from the Bible or sometimes four and it's getting in there. But the best case is me seeing it, reading it loud and engaging and underlying the text. The more you engage, the better you get. And it is God speaking to you. And so listen to the words of God. And that he's, uh, and so when Jesus is speaking here, he's talking to these Jewish leaders. He says, I want you to understand when I speak, you're hearing the Father speak. That there is no difference. Then he goes on, let's talk about the bread from heaven. The bread of heaven, Jesus again goes back to this topic of manna. Remember, the Jews were the ones who first brought up this topic. They were like, well, Jesus, let's see, uh, you think you're so great, you think you're the Messiah, well, perform, bring manna from heaven like Moses did, because Moses is so great, and what we think the Messiah is going to do is going to feed us with manna for 
eternity. And so Jesus goes back to the example of manna. And so as you read this, the reason why he keeps on using bread as an example, later on talking about his flesh and blood, is because he's using it as a metaphor and an analogy, going back to this because the, the Jews were the ones who first bought up bread. So let's read this text again. Uh, start on verse 47. It says this, truly, truly, or amen, amen, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. And this is the bread which comes down from heaven so that the one may eat of it and not die. I am living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever also. And the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, we could talk, take a long time look at this, but we're going to just touch briefly. Jesus now returns to the subject of the man, as we're saying, and about nourishment for the soul. Now, notice he uses, going back to manna, he talks about, well, Moses may gave you manna, and maybe that's all you want is just more worldly bread. But he says, you got, they had the bread, but eventually they still died. They still perish. If you're seeking to be satisfied with the things of this world, the bread of this world, the substance of this world, it will eventually be unsatisfied. It will not fulfill you. It will not give you life. Instead, you need the bread that comes from heaven. You need to come from not this manna per se, but the true bread that came from heaven, which is Jesus. You need a spiritual food, which is God incarnate, coming man, born of the Virgin Mary, who's going to offer herself for us. And he is that true bread, the true thing will give nourishment and health and vitality for our lives. Beloved, we need spiritual nourishment. We need spiritual food to feed our souls. And the reason why we often feel like there's a hole in our life, that there's something missing, and the people go and they try to fill it up with alcohol or drugs or movies or media or the internet or sex or whatever you may think. We try, people try to fill it up and they're still hungry because that food is failing. That food is perishing. And the reason why you're so hungry is because the whole, that hunger you're feeling is a spiritual need and only God can fill it. And it has to come down from heaven. It cannot come from this world. And so that bread which comes down from heaven is Jesus and that bread is what gives us life. Then and then it says in verse 52, then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now here the Jews are making a mistake. They're making the mistake of saying, taking Jesus literally. He's not literally talking about eat my flesh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. He, it's a metaphor, and it's a metaphor he only brought up because he brought up Moses. And so they're confused because they're getting lost in the metaphor is Jesus, as often we do. Uh, one thing, you, as you read the Bible, you need to be careful. There's some parts that are quite little, are, yes, literal. We need to take a little. But, you know, when Jesus says, I am the gate, he's not really a gate. When he says, I am bread, he's not literally bread. You know, when, when John says, behold, the Lamb of God takes away, he's not literally a lamb. And so the Jews make a mistake, as sometimes we make a mistake, when there's a metaphor that's trying to explain who Jesus is, and they get confused. So what is Jesus' response that they grumble again? They argue it again. In fact, they, it says this time it was, they were arguing with us. So now they went from grumbling to being like really fighting among themselves. And they're, or maybe getting even 
fighting among the disciples. Now, how can this be? And maybe they're, maybe they're even in the background getting ready to grab a couple of stones. And they're really angry at Jesus. It's not a peaceful thing. Now, one of the things I... Movies about Jesus don't always get right. It's, it's almost, it's almost like Jesus, every time it's always a peaceful scene around Jesus. No, the, Jesus really has these people angry. And if he wasn't the Messiah, rightfully so, but he is. Then he goes in further into spiritual food. And here we hit the section that I was just telling Nick in, in, in the Welcome Center is, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm looking forward to doing this first. Uh, because there's so much here, but it, we get lost. And again, because we get lost in the metaphor of it all. But verse 53 says this. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, or amen, amen, I said to you, unless you eat my flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. Then let me just stop for a second. They're angry with him. And they're getting ready to complain to him. And does Jesus like, oh, you know what? Maybe bad metaphor. Maybe I need to go somewhere else with it. No, Jesus doubles down. It's like, you, I need you to understand this. I want you to understand this idea that I am where you have life. And so Jesus d is not always a person who's going to create peace to the situation. We got this idea that Jesus always walked around and it was peaceful conversation. No, Jesus is riling up more by doubling down on this blood and flesh and eating it. It doesn't, goes on to 54, it says this, And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him upon the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats, oops, he, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Then we first read this passage. If you, if you ever ran across it or ever listened to it, you're like, what is going on? What is Jesus talking about? And you start scratching your head, and you're like, oh my, and maybe some of you right now is like, I don't know what pastor's going to do with this one. This is weird. But remember, it's like I said, Jesus is using this as a metaphor. He's using it as a metaphor, because just like eating and drinking is essential to life, so who he is, the essence of Jesus, his flesh and blood, that basically his being, who Jesus' very life, who he is, that is essential for your spiritual life. Is essential for your spiritual life. That's why he's, he's using a metaphor to understand how crucial and how important who Christ is. And that life, if you want true spiritual life, it comes from Jesus' life. Again, we know it's a metaphor he's using here, because if he's not being a metaphor, if he's being a literal, does he want them right there to kill him and start eating him or drink? No, because that would be against the, the, the <laughs> that would be against the law. The law would say to do cannibalism was a curse. You know, and that talks about in Deuteronomy 28 and Lamentation 2. But also the law forbade you to drink blood in Leviticus 17, 10 through 14. I, this is, so clearly, if what Jesus is saying is literal, he would be encouraging people to sin. Obviously, Jesus can't be encouraging them to sin, so he must be trying to use a metaphor that, again, they started with the manna. Therefore, we must be speaking metaphorically, just like blood gives life to the body, so Jesus gives life to our soul. Just like bread is essential to our life, so Jesus' very being is essential to our soul. He's trying to get us to understand the essential of this truth. And it also reminds you, as you think about his body and blood, it also kind of hints to Passover. Remember, this is Passover. And what was Passover about? As you remember when the, the, they went free from the exile. And what happened during the Passover is they sacrificed a, a sheep and they, they painted blood on the doorpost. And, and when, the, when the angel of death came by, it saw the blood and the Lord passed over the house. 
because they were covered by the blood of the lamb. And so to some degree, we get the, there's a hint of, of this blood and this body. And so to some degree, it is hinting at Passover. It is hinting to his death. Now, here's the thing that is unfortunate, and, and, and I, I feel sorry for um, those who are Roman Catholic. They have taken communion to be wrong. They, under, they understand it wrong because they have this idea of the doctor of transubstantiation. And this is a passage they go to. If you ask what, how you justify that the Eucharist is literally the blood, body and blood of Jesus. This is the passage they're using. But if you read it in context and understand this is a metaphor, then you won't get to that mistake. But this is the passage they go to. Now, they believe in the doctrine of where the bread and wine literally transform the body and blood of Jesus. And that's why at Mass... You ever wonder why, if you go to the Catholic Church, that thing in front is called an altar? The reason it's called altar is each time they partake in communion, it's another sacrifice. They are, to some degree, re-sacrificing Christ. And they're, they're re-taking and receiving Christ's bread and body again. And they quite literally think it's a Christ's blood and body, and so that's why that if you ever go to a Catholic Mass, they'll, they'll hand the communion wafer, and they'll have someone with a tray that, that goes, and, and if it falls, there's this whole ritual because it's God's body, and so they, and, and, and when you uh, look, they have this, um, I forgot what it's named, but I'll just call, them, call it a, uh, this place where they have the Eucharist, and you'll see them bow to it because quite literally they see that is God's presence there. And this is where they are getting lost. They got lost in the metaphor. They got lost in what this is about. And they, they turned it into a ritual where it's clearly Jesus is using this as a metaphor of what's going on. First, this passage uh, has nothing and directly, and as I was reading one of my commentaries, the, the, a lot of people say, oh, this has to do about communion. And that's an argument for science, because as you look from the passage, it doesn't mention anything about communion. Yeah, the shadows of communion, this has nothing about communion. So why Catholic says this has about communion, I don't know. It's not in the passage. There might be a shadow of it, but that's not what it's about. Second, it is kind of funny. If you go to a Catholic Mass... Okay, they'll, they'll say this is about Jesus' body and blood. If you go to Catholic Mass now, they only give you the wafer. You don't get the wine, only the priest and a couple select people. And think, well, that's odd. And they'll tell you if you go to a Catholic, in fact, I've listened online recently. They'll say, well, why you should be Catholic? Because it's all about the Eucharist. You need the Eucharist. And if you don't have the Eucharist, if you're not receiving the Eucharist, then you're not saved. Oh, Okay. And, and so they make, but I was like, well, what happened to the wine? And so there's a contradiction there. Third way we can tell this metaphor is because earlier in the passage, 640 is to see and believe in Jesus is eternal life. So it's the same thing, but that is probably more better to understand what he's trying to see and believe it's, in other words, he's just using different metaphor for putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So one metaphor is, eat and drink my blood and body. Another metaphor is, see and believe. But ultimately, what he's saying is, believe and trust who I am, that in me you have life and belief. And we know this is not by works. See, one of the things that Catholics make a mistake is they turn salvation into works, where, like I said, they would say you have to do this for salvation. But we know salvation is not based on communion. First, because if you remember the guy who died on the cross next to Jesus, he didn't have time to partake in communion. But more importantly, we have verses like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him 
Uh, oh, for, so God loved it that he gave his life only begotten son, that whoever believes him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's it. Believe. Acts 16 through 1. Believe in the Lord and you will be saved. We talked about this. But f- salvation is not by works. It's by faith. It's believing in Jesus Christ as a Lord. And the mistake that the Catholics makes, and some people make, is they turn salvation into work. But salvation was always by faith. And only he's using his body and blood as a metaphor to say, you have life. I have the life that comes out of the Father. Let me give you the life that I have. The only true spiritual life is found in him. And he's using his body as a metaphor of the life that we can receive through him. So that being said, the last part, life in Christ. And to some degree, this last part is just kind of summing up what we just said. Verse 57, as a living fire set me, I, I live because of the Father. See, he who eats of me, he will also live because of me. This is a bread which came down from heaven. Now as a fire ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Beloved, the main point in this passage, and all from beginning to end, is that you need, just like you need physical bread and water to live and breathe in this physical body, you need spiritual bread, spiritual water, Jesus, death, burial, resurrection. You need that is what you need for eternal life. And it's not based on your work or about your effort, but having faith that Jesus is who he said he did. And that he offers life as a Passover lamb for our sins so that the wrath of God would pass over us and we could receive his grace and mercy and eternal life. And remember, eternal life starts now. It's not a future thing. It is a now thing. It's a relationship with him. One of the things as it talks about eating and drinking, that verb it talks about is a present tense. In other words, we need to actively engage in relationship with God. It is not a relationship that you, it's Sunday, I have a relationship with God. Or Tuesday evening when I go to the Bible study, I have a relationship with God. No, eating and drinking every day when you wake up, you need to engage in relationship with God. As important as bread and water are important every day to sustain you for life, So you need to always draw to Christ, draw to his life, grow close to him because you need a spiritual food from him daily. And so that's why it's important to be in the Bible regularly. That is why you need, it's important to be always in prayer. That's why you need to be important to be in fellowship because you need to daily draw close to God and feed on Christ, what he has to offer, his life that he gave freely. And so let us all draw close to him. May may we receive Jesus as a sustainer for our souls. This is one of the passages that is probably one of the more difficult ones, very theological, but at the same time is a very basic message. There's all that you need in life to sustain you, to move you, to help you move forward, to have meaning and purpose for life is found in Jesus Christ. He is a substance that your soul, that your soul longs for. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord, say, I call and I, I implore you, put your faith in Jesus Christ and he will meet you and he'll give you meaning and purpose and peace and he will forgive you and you will see mercy and grace. He is what sustains you and gives us life. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you and have a good day.